click record so we make sure that we capture everything. And um, let's start from the beginning because I know uh, I got a message to say that things hadn't recorded. So hopefully if you can just pop a note in the chat box, just let me know that you can see and hear everything um, and that we are all good to go again because it's such an important topic. I'd hate to think that I'm chatting to myself and nothing is really coming through. All right, so um, let's kick off again. So we're talking about creating a cybersecurity policy for your business. Um, we do only have an hour. That was one of the big things we talked about. So there is a lot to cover in that time. Thank you, Peter. Lots to cover in that time. So um, we are going to kind of move this along fairly quickly. It's a bit of a top level discussion tonight. So what I really want to do is encourage you to just start thinking about security for your business overall. So this is the start of the conversation. Um, and I want you to really take this information away tonight and start to think about, you know, what have you got to consider in your business? What are your risks? What are your vulnerabilities? What do you need to put in place? And what do you need to, um, you know, to, to be thinking about longer term? Uh, the webinar is brought to you in collaboration with ASPAS, the Australian Small Business Advisory Service. So thank you to Business Station, ASPAS and RDA Brisbane for the collaboration of this event. Uh, and we'll talk a little more about uh, what other things ASPAS have coming up later on as well as how we can have a one-to-one -one consultation. So if you want to do a bit of a deep dive into cybersecurity for your business, we can certainly do that through the ASPAS program. All right, so I want to kick off with some stats just to kind of paint the picture for you around the serious nature of cybersecurity. Look, let's be honest, it's not the sexiest topic in the world, but it is something that we need to be aware of. And we need to stay on top of this stuff because as soon as something happens and we get a security patch through, we get an update, we find out about a phishing scam, you can bet that the uh, the baddies of the world have moved on to the next thing. So it's really really important that this is an ongoing piece of work for you in your business. Now, when I wrote my book, The End of Technophobia, A Practical Guide to Digitizing Your Business, I put a whole section on cybersecurity in the book. And when I was researching it, some of these stats that I've used tonight really kind of blew me away. And that's 43% of all cyber attacks that aimed at small business. Now, why? Predominantly because they know that we're a soft touch. We tend not to put as much time, effort, energy, or thought into the overarching security of our business. If you're looking at a bank, Woolworths, any of the big institutions, they have a team of people whose job it is to just sit and stay up to date, make sure that they've got, you know, everything as buttoned down as they can. But they know that small business owners are a soft touch. A little over a quarter of a million dollars is the average cost to an Australian small business who experiences a cyber attack. Now, I don't know about you, that would pretty well wipe me out. I could not afford to lose that kind of income or that kind of money. Um, so, you know, we certainly want to be making sure that we're doing everything we can to avoid those kinds of numbers. And then if we think about the average time to resolution, if your business experiences a cyber attack is 23 days, you know, Again, I couldn't afford to be offline for a month. So think about your business. What would that look like if you had no website, if you couldn't get emails, if you had no access to information, anything like that for a month? Could you survive that? What would that look like? And then talking a little bit around, because we'll talk about website hacking as part of this evening's content. The most popular website uh, globally is WordPress. Around 35% of all websites are created in WordPress. And around 46% of all web applications have critical vulnerabilities. So it's not just our website. It's not just email. It's not just social media. It's thinking about this as a united front our devices, our phones, our social media, our emails, our file storage system. It's thinking about this thing as a combined holistic view of our business. 
All right. So let's talk about the risks before we move into the solutions. Really good to know what's out there and what the most common forms of cybersecurity threats are to our small businesses. So the first one and the most popular one that we typically all come across is phishing attacks. Now, this is where people just typically send an email and they're phishing for information. Now, there are some super, um, you know, well done planned emails that are being sent out, things from looking like they're from banks, from ATO, from, you know, you name it, you've probably seen one now. There are some ways that you can identify, but they're getting trickier and trickier. So we're going to talk about, you know, zero trust policy when it comes to emails, but let's talk a little bit about phishing. So around about uh, 57% of all companies experience phishing attacks. So whether it's, you know, you've just got the latest email to say, you know, reset your password by clicking here, or the bank has identified something, please email us back with your surname and your account number, your date of birth, etc. Some of those are easy to spot. You look at the email and, you know, it might be Westpac Bank, but it's Westpac at gmail.com. You know, there's some ways that we can kind of tell straight away that's a phishing attack, throw it to junk. But some of them, as I said, are really quite sophisticated. So let's have a look at the uh, the 2019 Internet Security Threat Report suggested that the most common email subject headlines that are used in phishing attacks, if you get anything with urgent request, important payment or attention in there, have you have your little radar up already be suspicious on the flip side of that if you're creating emails from your business that are genuine that you want to maybe a newsletter or you're trying to keep in touch with people please do not use any of those five uh, topics in your subject line they will throw spam filters and junk mail into alarms alarms will go off left right and center and your emails will not reach their destinations Okay. Um, in 2020, during uh, during COVID, there were a lot of phishing attacks that came out. In fact, the FBI uh, went from a thousand uh, reports of phishing attacks per week to four thousand. So it increased, you know, really dramatically, very very quickly. Uh, and what they recognised, or Checkpoint uh, recognised, that there were some really popular brands that became. Um, you know, really popular to impersonate with phishing scams. So Apple, Netflix, Yahoo, WhatsApp, PayPal, Chase Bank, Facebook, Microsoft, eBay, Amazon. So again, just to have a little radar up that if you get an email that says it's from Apple or Netflix or Facebook or eBay or anything, automatically have your radar locked on that is this a scam, you know, especially if they're asking you to submit information or share your password or click on this link, they just won't do it. So just make sure that you're being very, very mindful. Um, Apple today, for example, sent emails out after their big spring loaded event. So that was on at 3 a.m. Australian time or Queensland time. And then this morning there was an email came out that said, you know, hey, we've got, you know, new iPad Pros and things like that coming out. Now that made sense because it followed off the back of the event. But I also just went to the apple.com website and went through there rather than clicking on any links in any email. So just things like that. Just be aware and have your little radar set to, you know, the BS monitor is very, very high. So the main types of data that people are after during a phishing expedition, typically bank details. So account number, credit card information. So that will be where they will um, impersonate your bank. So, um, you know, something from Westpac when you bank with ANZ, you can fairly well tell pretty quickly that, you know, that's going to be a scam. But if they're asking you to submit account numbers, credit card information, Put any kind of personal details, any kind of click on this link, your bank will not do it. So junk it, get rid of it straight away. If at all you're suspicious and you think, actually, this looks pretty legit, close it down, ring your bank. They will tell you straight away whether it's actually legit um, and give you another way to access that information. Another way that people are looking for data through phishing expeditions, personal data, your name, your address, your email address. 
if they can cobble that together, and we're going to talk about social media because it's a great way for um, cyber security or cyber uh, attackers to get information, you know, clicking on links about what type of Disney princess am I or, you know, when were you born? What month were you born? Um, submit the your street name. So, you know, coming up with those stripper names or um, dwarf names at Christmas time and things, don't do it. You're giving people all the information they need to go away and set up a fake profile and, you know, potentially just rip off your entire ID and run up debts under your name. So just be really, really cautious. Internal data. So this ha typically happens in larger organizations where people might be looking for uh, sales information, product roadmap. So again, if I use the Apple example, um, people wanting to know what Apple has coming up so they could potentially, you know, rip that IP off and create it before Apple and, and bring it first to market. So that one, not so much for small businesses, but certainly the bank and the personal data. Credentials, absolutely. People are after passwords, username, PIN numbers. So they will be very cunning around ways that they will ask you for that information. And then medical things, treatment information, insurance claims, et cetera. Again, they're looking for your information where they can recreate you in a cyber environment to then go and, you know, set up an a eBay account where they can, you know, run your name into the mud, run up bills, run up accounts, things like that. Really, really difficult to um, block that once the, the horse is bolted. So that's phishing scams, probably the most popular. The next one is malware. Now, typically we see malware uh, introduced either in emails or on websites. They're the, the traditional ways. So there's a few different types of malware. One is a Trojan, which disguise, you know, named after the Trojan horse, disguises itself as good code to infiltrate the system and then it disables. So it gets in, you know, via the Trojan and then it you know, wreaks havoc in your system in the back end. Adware, we see this a lot. I see this so many times. This is where it'll just pop up unwanted advertisements. So you've clicked on a link in an email, you've done something, it's downloaded a bit of software into your uh, computer, which then starts feeding you ads and starts sending a whole bunch of trashy, spammy kind of stuff. Spyware, spyware starts collecting information from your computer and you don't even know. So again, you've clicked on a link, you've downloaded a something and it's in, uh, put a piece of code on your computer that starts going around the back end and collecting all of your personal information. Worms, so these are target um, kind of vulnerabilities within the system and then they'll install themselves on a network. So this is not such a big one if you're running a one-man operation or a smaller thing, but if you have a network of computers uh, across, particularly when we started to work from home, right, you have a few people working in the organisation, um, it can infiltrate all of the computers and all of the devices on your network and then it will often be followed up by a denial of service, a DDoS attack, where it will steal valuable or sensitive information from your computer, client um, information, banking information, finance, things like that. Keyloggers, keyloggers can be good and bad. So I've seen keyloggers used in organizations to keep an eye on what their staff are up to, you know, what information they're sending, what are their emails saying, what social media are they logging onto, what websites are they going to, et cetera. Um, so that's a practical application. But the more nefarious is where they will be able to figure out by what you're typing on your keyboard, what your password is for your banking account, what, you know, those kinds of things. So keyloggers are another form form of malware. Um, so as I said, malware can get onto your computer in a variety of ways. So opening an email attachment that has malware, uh, clicking on a fake error message or a pop-up. So if you're on a website and a pop-up comes up and you click on it, that can often, often that can have malware in it, depending on the, the company. Visiting a website that's infected by malware, and that can be, you know, harmless. You might be supporting a friend, you've gone to their website, you click on something, but you don't realize your friend's business has been compromised. So again, just that radar up of being super, super cautious that anytime you are online, you're kind of always thinking about, oh, you know, what's this link? Is this secure? Should I be? What's that going to look like? 
and downloading free software from the internet. Now, this is particularly relevant for my PC users. Now I'm an Apple user, so they tend to be, and they've got a little bit of extra security to them. They're not completely impenetrable, but, um, you know, just being really, really cautious on a PC or on an Android phone or a Google phone, what are you downloading to your phone? So at least in the Apple universe, they control the app store. It is extremely controlling. I'm not going to deny that, but there is a certain level of security that we know that if I download a app from the app store, there's a very, very good chance it has not been compromised. If I go onto Google Play and download something, I don't have to jump through as many hoops to get that app loaded onto the, the Google Play or the Android store. So just being, again, radars up, shackles up, just what am I downloading? What do I need to do? How do I do this? And thinking about what the implications, thinking it through. All right, ransomware. So ransomware is a type of malware. It gets into your systems and encrypts or prevents you from then accessing that information. And then you'll be asked to pay a ransom to access your own files. This is getting really, really common. Websites, it's a big one with websites. So they'll get into the back end of your WordPress, um, they'll change all the, the login details, and then you'll get an email to say, unless you pay us, blah, 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 Bitcoin, whatever, you're not getting access to the site again, or you're not getting access to your emails, or you're not getting access to your social media. I've seen it with people's Facebook accounts and social media, Instagram, things like that. The average cost of a ransomware attack on a business is around $133,000. So again, not insignificant dollars, right? We're talking about this could be a major upset. It could even be the end to some businesses that I talk to if something like this happens. All right, website hacking. We just touched on this briefly. Um, a really, really common thing. So according to University of Maryland, hackers are attacking every 39 seconds. On average, a little over 2,200 times per day. So they've just got a bunch of code and a bunch of things that are going out all the time, just kind of prodding around the edges of people's websites and looking for a vulnerability, looking for a crack that they can wedge open, get in there and do some real damage. Um, and again, according to IBM 2019, it took an average of 206 days to identify an attack. So that's really scary, right? Because some of these ones aren't just ransomware. They're, they're getting in and shutting you out and then going, pay me a bunch of money and I'll let you back in. They could be doing some really nefarious stuff in the background, key logging, collecting your information, and you don't even know. And then, you know, half a year later, six months later, you find out, oh, my God, I've been, you know, compromised, I've been skimmed from these accounts, this thing's gone and been set up and I didn't even know. All right. Brute force attack. Again, this one's not as common uh, on smaller businesses, but we are seeing it a bit with WordPress sites, Wix sites as well. Um, and it uses a piece of software that just generates passwords over and over and over again, um, becoming increasingly forceful to try and uh, gain access into your website or into your system. So not just necessarily a website, it might be your uh, OneDrive if you're a Microsoft or G Drive, G Suite if you're Google, you know, those kinds of things where it's just looking for and it just keeps tapping away. And you can imagine if you've got a piece of software that's just running in the background, changing codes and changing, you know, things every 15 seconds quicker than we can think, it's just going to be, again, prodding around the edges, looking for an opportunity to kind of crack in and open things up. Why do they do it? Because often with a brute, brute force attack, they'll insert adware. So again, um, I see Katie's joined us, you know, so Katie's site's been compromised. Katie doesn't know. I log in and I'm, I'm just bombarded with a bunch of ads or adware starting to pop up, you know, go to this site, look at this thing, do this thing. Um, it can reroute your entire website traffic to a paid site, to a, a site where they're getting one cent per click, like an Amazon thing. Um, you know, so again, I go to go to Katie's site or Peter's site and I'm redirected to a site where they're getting, you know, X amount of cents per click. So it's a really quick way for them to generate some really good revenue. And by infecting all of your visitors or clients' data 
with malware, so remember we talked about malware a moment ago, to continue to spread the virus. So all of this stuff is about uh, populating and, and making this thing bigger than what it was to begin with. So it goes forward once it's into your stuff and goes out and, again, then tries to access, you know, Peter site's been compromised, so now it tries to compromise all of Peter's clients. And once it's into my system because... I've gone to Peter's site, it'll then go out through my system. So it's looking to, like a virus, like COVID, like the flu, like anything, it's looking to stay alive and continue its evolution as it goes. All right, so they're the big risks. There are a few others, but look, they're the main ones that small businesses encounter and that we're seeing happening on a daily basis. So now I want to spend some time talking about what can you do, what do you need to be thinking about in developing your own protection plan, your own cybersecurity plan. Um, now, if you've got any questions, just pop them in. I've got the chat box open on the side, so feel free to just pop some questions in. We'll make sure that we get to them as we're chatting along. Um, as I said, we have got a bucket load of content to get through. So just want to make sure that you're getting everything you need from tonight's webinar. All right. So before you even start documenting your own cybersecurity policy, I want you to just take a few moments when you watch the recording, sit down with a cup of coffee, maybe a glass of wine, maybe something stronger, and just start to think about what are the assets, what's kind of going on in your business. So make a list of all of your assets. So by that, I mean, you know, what what laptops, what computers? So if I was to look around our house, you know, we've got um, uh, Apple TV, we've got, you know, some internet of things devices. So we've got some security cameras and things. Now, remember, they've all got passwords onto a Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi, the modem. So make a list of all of those things and start thinking about what are the ways that people could be looking to access or trying to access your information mobile phones, tablets, smart TVs, if you've got a fridge connected, a washing machine connected, anything now that is an internet of things, doorbell, smart cameras, anything like that, add them to your list when you're doing up your, your asset registry and just pop them on the list for the moment. Identify the threats that you think could be an option in your business. Definitely phishing, 100% for everyone. Website hacking, I'd say 100% for everyone. But then thinking about some of the other ones, malware, probably. Ransomware, potentially. Brute force attacks, you know, just kind of run through and think about what are the ways, what are you, where are you exposed, what could you be uh, coming up against that you haven't even realized. How are you sharing your information online? So just think about the way you interact with your own social media. So if you have Facebook or Instagram, LinkedIn, um, just think about what you're sharing online. Are you sharing photos of your kids? Are you playing some of those games where, you know, um, you put the the month you were born and um, the, the letter of your first surname or the, you know, surname or something like that and it generates a, a dwarf's name or something like that. You're giving away personal information. So start thinking about what are you actually sharing online that you haven't thought. You know, during COVID, I saw a bunch of those questionnaires come out on Facebook where, oh, I just want to get to know my friends better. Um, you know, what's your mum's surname or what was your mum's maiden name and how many um, brothers have you got and um, what was the street that you grew up on and what was the name of your first pet and, you know, a bunch of questions and then share it with your friends and let's get to know everyone. The amount of information that people give away without even thinking just boggles my mind. So think about what you're giving away online. Maybe take a scroll back through your Facebook and see what you've shared or what you've talked about over the last six months, 12 months, and just really start to familiarize yourself with just how open and, and you know, um, trusting you are online. And think about what you share via emails and things. Are you sharing links? Are you asking people to do things that are, you know, potentially exposing them and exposing you? 
how do you handle client information now? Do you have a CRM? Is the CRM secure? Um, do you store paper files? Do you store files in Word? Or, you know, have you got a, a, a closed network? How are you storing that information? Just make some few notes and we'll, we'll talk about how this all fits together. How are you creating and storing passwords? You know, one of the biggest vulnerabilities for small businesses online is their password management. You know, so never use your birthday, never use an anniversary, never use your kids' birthdays, never use your pets' names, your kids' names, the street that you live on, one, two, three, four. Never use the, the um, company name, so Zoom, one, two, three, four, for example. You know, just think about how you're creating your passwords and how you're storing them. Have you got them written on a piece of paper? Are they stored in an asset registry somewhere? What are you doing with that? What's your email security? So, you know, how are you, um, do you have a policy for not clicking on any links? Do your team know what your, their expectation is? If they get an email in from a client that has a, you know, I've just sent this invoice through, please click on it and have a look. Do they know zero trust? Do they know what's, what's your thinking around email security right now? What's your website security? Have you got a security plugin for your website? Have you got any virus on your computers? How often are you backing things up? What does that all look like? Just take half an hour, an hour to really kind of document where things are at for you right now so you can build a plan of where you're at. You're not necessarily having to start from scratch. And what does your plan look like if you're breached? So if you find out your website's been hacked, then what? Have you got a, a web person that you go to? Have you got an IT person? What's your team do? If they click on a link and then realize it's something, are they going to try and bury it and pretend it never happened? Or is there a process? Have you got a way that they can come to you and go, oh, okay, I'm really sorry. I clicked on this link and I thought it was legit. And, you know, nothing's happened, but, um, you know, are they going to come forward? What's the policy around that? So they're the things to consider before you even start developing your policy, right? Because here's the thing about your security, your cybersecurity plan or your cybersecurity policy. It's going to be as individual as everybody watching this webinar. So if you run a hotel, you're going to need very different kind of stuff versus um, Katie is an, archi an architect or whether you're running a retail business or a wholesale business or a coaching business, whether you're doing everything online via e-commerce or whether you store very little online. So just getting your ducks in a row to begin with and thinking about where the business is at right now and just what you need to think through is really going to help you when it comes to the next bit. So when it comes to developing your plan, I kind of think this thing through in pillars or in stages. So there's a number of different areas that we need to be considering. And the first one is dealing with our technology. So thinking about things like, you know, if you're working in an office and you've got a few people around you, screens off when you're not in use. So if someone's getting up to go to make a coffee or go for lunch, they, you know, it becomes policy. You write it into your plan that screens go off when they're not in use, just so there's no chance that anyone can sit down and see some vulnerable information. They can look up a client um, brief. They could find something easily. So screens go off. What's, your, what's going to be your plan for running updates and security patches? Who does that? Is everybody responsible for their own computer? Or do you have someone who sits overarching and make sure that those security updates are run on a regular basis. Do you get notifications? Do you want to get notifications when there's a security update available? Um, if you work, if you live in the, the Microsoft universe, you know, there's, there's patches coming through all the time. Uh, same with Apple. There's always patches coming through on your phone or on your watch to let you know that there's new security um, patches. You just do a, an update overnight. Um, the same with your website. You know, you should have those things in place. What's your antivirus software? If you don't have one and you run a PC or you run a business, 
definitely look into getting some kind of antivirus software. And what does that look like? Is it something that you're going to subscribe to on a, on a you know, monthly basis or are you going to buy the subscription uh, for 12 months? How are you going to back things up? You know, having that backup, if your website was hacked, and they say to you, hey, Katie, hey, Jane, um, you know, we're, we've just logged in, uh, give us $100,000 or you're not getting this information back. If that happened to me, I could go, you know, go your hardest, buddy. Well, I'm probably going to say them. I'm not going to antagonize them. Go your hardest, buddy. And I'm just going to restore my backup from the night before. So, you know, thinking about how often you want to back that information up. So if something like that does happen, it's inconvenient. It's not pretty, but you've got something there that you are, you're okay to lose this much data, but not okay to lose that much data. So depending on your company, depending on what type of business you run, could you afford to lose a week's worth of information? Could you afford to lose a day's worth of information? Half a day, a month, whatever that looks like for you, that's how often you need to be running backups on your system. So maybe it's every night overnight. Um, scanning and using USB and portable devices. Again, boggles my mind when I go to events and they hand out a USB stick as part of the event. They are just ripe for transmitting viruses. So there was a thing a couple of years ago where people would go out searching for USB devices that were left around the place. So it might have been put into a brick wall. It might have been put into a, a garden. You'd upload the information. You'd add something to it. And then you'd you know, put new coordinates out and people would go searching for these things you don't know what's being loaded onto those USB devices. Please do not stick a USB device into your laptop or, or desktop unless you actually know 100% what's on that and the heritage of that device. So just letting, again, putting it into your plan that, you know, you will supply USB devices to your team members. They're not to just randomly go out and be given one at a store or at an event and that's okay you will control the data you will control the information how do you want to store your tech so that's down to um you know laptops mobile phones right through to you know your online components so what does it look like if somebody on boards do you give them devices is that part of the onboarding if so how do you store that technology when it's not in use? Do you make sure that you wipe it in between um, team members using it? So if you have laptops and you recycle them, you know, wiping that data off and making sure the slate's clean before a new person takes the device over. Just thinking through the whole, how are you going to deal with your tech? Um, team onboarding. So what happens when a new person starts or leaves? Do they have access to your social media? Do you need to be changing passwords? Do you need to log them out? What about emails? What about um, Google Drive, Microsoft Drive, whatever it is, what you're using, you need to have a policy. You need to document what that looks like when people start and leave. Who's backing up the information? We talked about that and how often, how much you prepared to lose. So that's the first pillar. They're not in any order. They're just the pillars that I think that we need to be thinking of. And that's your tech pillar. Then I want you to think about your social media. Now, this is an area that I see overlooked considerably, and it is a huge vulnerability as we've talked through for small business owners. So just thinking about what sites are appropriate for use on work devices. Now, Years ago, when I was still in a corporate gig and I worked for Telstra, all of the laptops were locked to internet. We could only access intranet, internal sites approved by Telstra. So there was no accessing Facebook or LinkedIn. There was no doing any of that stuff. There was no Googling things. Um, now, I'm not suggesting, you know, you need to go that harsh, but just having a policy in place that, you know, if it's a work laptop, and they don't have to be using Facebook, you know, do you want them not accessing Facebook through that site? What does that look like? YouTube, et cetera. Again, just thinking it through. What does it look like? What's relevant for your business? If they're, um, you know, putting information onto their social media for your business, then what information will, are they going to share online? What is appropriate? What do you want the company persona to be online and what's your stance for 
you know, sharing links? Do you want to even share links on your social media? Or do you feel as though that is exposing your clients to a risk that you're not willing to run? How do you want your team logging in to information on social media? You know, do you want them using work emails? If that email gets compromised, you know, do you want them using personal emails? What does that look like? Make sure for all of your social media accounts for your businesses that you have business accounts set up. So Facebook for business, Instagram for business, you know, those business profiles are set up and ready to roll and that you have administration rights that you own and you never hand those off. So anyone who's using your social media for your business and posting on your behalf, editor access, different levels of access, but never hand off administration. It's the quickest way to get yourself locked, excuse me, locked out of your site, you know, with no ability to claw that back. So just thinking again, thinking that stuff through. What's your handover policy? So if a team member leaves, how quickly do you log onto Facebook and remove them? You know, how quickly do you change the the password so they can't log in from their home thing and leave you a bad review or, you know, damage your reputation online? Okay, so we've done technology, we've done social media. So the next one is handling client data. So, you know, even going right back to the beginning and thinking about, what level of privacy do your clients, do you, you know, as a business, do your clients deserve? Do you share client information throughout the whole organization? Do different people have access to different pieces of information about your clients? You know, potentially you might be seeing financial information and you don't want a junior or a, an admin person necessarily having access to that. So again, just thinking it through, what's your policy for privacy? Even just saying, you know, we'll never share. I'll never share your emails with a marketing company. You know, I'll send you newsletters. I might promote event I'm doing in conjunction with someone, but I'm never going to hand your information off to that person that I'm doing that event with unless you've given me the okay or unless you've decided then to sign up for their work. So just talking about and thinking through what your policy is for your client privacy. Do you have clients just in Australia or do you work with people internationally? If you work with people internationally, signing up for the GDPR requirements, they're a lot more stringent. Um, but, you know, if you have a CRM ticking a little box in there to say GDPR, we'll do everything that you need to do to make sure that you're being um, 100% committed to that kind of level of privacy and requirement that is needed. Um, identifying sensitive data. So just, again, having a policy for the business to say, and some of this may not be relevant for you, right? But just thinking it through that as you grow, that if we onboard a client, who gets what information in what order and what does that look like? Where and how will you store the client information? Does it go into a CRM? Does it go into your accounting system? Does it go into OneDrive or G Drive? Where are you storing this stuff and what does it look like? How do you destroy data securely? Or if you've, you know, filled out a, a work with a lot of allied health professionals and there's still a lot of handwritten information, um, what do you, where do you store that? What does that look like? How do you destroy that stuff securely? I don't want my medical information being, you know, just thrown in the bin on a Thursday afternoon to be recycled. How are you going to convey how you will share and destroy that information? And what are you going to tell me to put my mind at ease as your client? How's your team going to access and share data? What are your, your mechanisms for that? Again, Microsoft, Google, Dropbox, you know, are you using Trello? Are you using project management software? What does that look like? And thinking about just putting some dot points around, this is how we handle our client data. This is the minimum expectation of our business. Handling business information. So this is your internal stuff now. You know, where do you store your stuff? Again, Google Drive, OneDrive, Dropbox, et cetera. Do you have a mechanism for, 
you know, um, everything goes via G Drive into admin, into clients. Each client has its own folder. Within each of the folders, the lockdown to admin, finance, marketing, whatever that needs to be. But thinking that through and thinking about who has access to what and what that means in terms of your risks, your vulnerabilities for your clients as well. Where are you going to store um, priceless? Where are you going to store team member information? Remember, it's not just our clients. It's our team members. So, you know, potentially I've got banking details for them. I've got super info. I've got holiday information. I've got a lot of information that could be stolen from me and used in identity theft. So how am I going to protect my team members? What about banking and finance? What are you doing to protect that? Again, thinking through your password management. You know, if you've just got your banking software, um, you log into your bank, uh, your you know, you log into your bank with the the name of your firstborn child and your wedding anniversary, you know, do you give that information to your admin person? Thinking about things like LastPass or password managers will help you secure that information. But again, right now, it's just about getting these things onto a bit of paper and starting to get the gray matter working through and going, all right, do we really need to be, is this something we need to be worried about? Is this something we need to put more thought into at the very minimum coming up with a one pager at the end of this to go, here's our policy for social, for technology, for, you know, what that looks like. All right, and the next one, password management. Will you use a password management system? If so, which one? You know, uh, again, I'm an Apple user, so Apple um, keyword uh, keychain, fantastic. LastPass, I've got a lot of clients that use that. It's exceptionally good for being able to share a temporary password with a contractor. So again, if I'm working with a VA or a, um, a web person that I might only want to just have access to that one thing instead of them giving them my login, which you should never do, you can generate a one-time or a regular password that they can use to access. And then what do you do if they leave? How does that look? What's your password protocol? How often are you changing or updating your passwords? What happens if a team member leaves or changes? Who's responsible for going in and changing that, making sure that information is up to date? Um, as I said, who changes passwords? How is that communicated out? And remember, one password, unique password for each site and each application. Please do not use the same password to log into your bank, to log into your email, to log into your website. That is just a disaster waiting to happen because guaranteed, if you get hacked on one thing, they will then use that to try again, poke around the outside, the vulnerability. So if you're the same password for your Facebook as you are for your Instagram, as you are for LinkedIn, as you are for your website, they've suddenly got your whole business. So again, just thinking it through. Email security. If I can get one through thing through to you tonight, zero trust. You know, just every email that comes in, I have a zero trust policy. Unless um, Brad has said to me, hey, Trace, I'm just about to email you uh, a link to my website. Can you go in and have a look and tell me what you think? If I get an email from Brad out of the blue, I am not clicking on that link. I'll drop Brad an email or I'll drop him a text or I'll drop him a phone call and say, hey, buddy, I just got a, an email from you that's got a website link in it. Is that legit? You know, so just instilling in your team and instilling in yourself zero trust policy on emails, anything with a link, anything with a, you know, download this file, just don't do it. Check in with the organization that is sending it to you and just say, I just got an email from you that had to download this file. Is this legit? You know, after you've done the basic checks yourself. So if the email doesn't match up. So if I get something from Katie and instead of it being her company email, it's Katie at Hotmail you know, I know to, to put that into the junk mail. Do all of your team members and do you know how to block spam and report suspicious emails? So do you know how to report a, a phishing attack? Do you know how to move something into junk and never see it from that again? Do you know how to block a phone call on your phone if it's a spam, uh, a phishing phone call? You know, those kinds of things, they're the things you want to build into your policy. So again, as you onboard new people, even if it's a VA, anyone, remote, based face-to-face, -face, you can say to them, here's our policy on email security. 
one pager, nice and simple, zero trust. You know, here's how we block things on email. Here's how we block things. Um, when do you want your team sharing emails? You know, again, thinking about client security, thinking about data security. Is it necessary to bli- to uh, reply all on an email or can you just reply to the one person or share the information with the one person? Again, we talked about opening and clicking on links and emails. Just don't do it unless you absolutely know 100% they're legit and downloading email attachments. Even when, you know, um, in Facebook, I'll get people all the time send me a a funny YouTube thing to have a look at as a video in Messenger. I'll ring or text my mate and say, hey, was that really you? Is that legit before I'll look at it? Because, you know, that kind of um, willingness to just click on something because, oh, a mate sent it to me and it's on Facebook, it must be okay. No, a lot of viruses can be hidden behind videos you know they can be trojans so it's a it's a funny happy cat video playing on a windowsill you click on it and have a good laugh but what's happened in the background is you, you know the trojan has come through and installed some malicious software on your phone or on your laptop or on your desktop so just thinking it through and i guess the biggest thing for me is raising your hackles and being really really prickly to anything that's kind of happening online within your business um, and then finally, I want you to think about a cybersecurity incident's happen. Now what? How do you want team members to report an incident to you? You know, even if it's just, oh, I'd opened up Facebook, my mate sent me a cat on a windowsill, I clicked on it, and now I'm getting some weird pop-ups happening. You know, how do you want them to let you know that's happened? Um Thinking about depending on the industries, and this is going to be really specific to the businesses that are online tonight and talking, um, you may have some industry standards that you have no option but to report a cybersecurity incident. So you need to be aware of that and you need to know whether you're sitting inside one of the companies or one of the industries that legally have to report we've had a breach of protocol. It's not a big thing. It's just a form that you fill out, but you will need to know that and you'll need to know what that looks like if it happens. What internal actions do you need to take? So, you know, does someone escalate it to Katie? Katie escalates it to the owner and then the owner has to fill in the paperwork or gets an IT person in or gets a cybersecurity person in. What does that look like? Just think it through. How are you going to notify your clients if a breach happens? So if your website gets hacked um, or your email gets compromised or your Facebook, how are you going to let them know? What's that policy look like? You know, who's going to do that? How are they going to do that? And what are you going to tell them? Uh, Sorry, we got, you know, hacked. We're doing our best to overcome it. Or are you going to have a look at 3.45 today? We were um, hacked. They got through. This is what we know. This is what we're doing. We'll keep you up to date big difference with the way things are handled and a lot of trust can be built in that moment by being forthright, by being open, by being being honest. Roles and responsibilities of your team members, who's responsible for what? Everybody in the organization is responsible for cybersecurity, but what's the level of escalation? Who's going to keep you up to date with things? Are you going to have one person in the company that you know, you you give them an hour every week to make sure they're across all the stuff or a couple of hours every week, or is it everybody's responsibility within their own area? Think it through, document it. Okay, so a few other things to consider before we, um, and if you've got questions, start popping them in the chat box. We'll make sure that we get to them. Um, so some final things to consider. We talked about antivirus software. Definitely, definitely, definitely look into it. There are a bunch of them um, around now. Back in the day, it was just kind of Norton's and um I want to say McCaffrey, but I think they're a bus company. Anyway, if you Google best antivirus software 2021 PC, Mac, industry, architects, hotels, whatever start from there, start doing some investigation, ask around what are your allies using, what are people in your industry using, start to do some investigation, what does it look like, what are the costs going to be, all that kind of stuff. Make sure you've got your policy around keeping your software and your hardware up to date, 
what does that look like? How often are you backing up? The Apple event, as I said, was on early this morning. I'm now talking about the new iMac. So what's that going to look like? How am I going to, um, you know, what's my on-ramp from my existing device to my new device and what happens to my old device? Making sure that gets wiped. Whose responsibility is that? If you're going to sell it, what does that look like? just thinking those things through. Consider cybersecurity insurance. You know, depending on your organization, that might be a worthwhile investment for you. You can get it. Um, you know, I'm not going to say it's a good or a bad thing, but I think everybody should be aware of it. And I think everybody should at least have a look at what is on offer. Um, if you have your, you know, your backups and all that kind of stuff done, you know, look, honestly, the cybersecurity people will pay out ransomware attacks. But to me, if you've got your website backed up and all I'm going to lose is a blog or two, you know, maybe I don't need cybersecurity. Maybe I just need to reinstall the backup from last week. But thinking it through, knowing there is cybersecurity insurance and what does that look like? Think twice before clicking on links, you know, zero trust. It's a horrible thing to say, but online now, zero trust, zero trust, zero trust. Do not trust anything unless you're expecting it to come through. Um, strong passwords, having a password management system, using something like LastPass. It's not the only option, but it's a popular one. Using something like Apple Keychain, having that mechanism in place. Making sure that you've got an SSL certificate on your website. So that's your secure link for your website. Bare minimum, if you're doing any kind of e-commerce or transacting online, you absolutely must have an SSL certificate. So Google, ask your web guy, what does that look like? Or web girl, what does that look like? How do I get that if I don't have it? You'll know if you've got it because when you when you type your web domain in, instead of HTTP, it's HTTPS for secure. Auto logout for inactive users, an easy one to put in place that, you know, um, I have uh, my screen will automatically go blank if I haven't touched it for five minutes. Um, you can set that for quicker. You can also create auto logout for inactive users. So if someone hasn't been online for 30 minutes, it automatically logs them out or five minutes or an hour or whatever that thing is. Have a website backup. So speak to your web person about how do we make sure that we're backing up the website what does that look like? Again, thinking about how much data can I afford to lose a day, a week, a month? What does that look like? Install capture software. So, you know, when you're on a website and you go to sign up for something and it says, click on all the palm trees or uh, type in this weird code that looks like it's kind of half pixelated, half hieroglyphics, that's capture software that just prevents a lot of the stuff kind of happening before it even gets in. Consider encryption software. So again, depending on the industry, depending on what you're looking at doing, do you need to run encryption software across the back end of your site or across your emails? Um, definitely have security plugins for your websites, uh, making sure that you're running the best security plugins. I'm not going to talk to you about what that is. Again, speak to your web person or do some, some research because they will vary depending on WordPress, Wix, what themes you're using, Squarespace, all that kind of stuff, e-commerce, et cetera. So speak to your web person about that. Do not share personal information on social media. Just don't do it. You know, again, um, the amount of times I see people sharing photos of themselves while they're on holidays. Isn't that wonderful? We're having a great time in Airlie Beach. Hello, house is completely empty. Um, I'm telling you that online. So thinking about, you know, what information are you prepared to share online? Um, and it's not just about the business, right? It's about keeping your people safe as well. So thinking through if they're sharing information you know, I'm thinking as a hacker, well, maybe they're using that as their password for the business account. So just thinking that through. Avoiding common passwords, using two-factor authentication wherever it's available. Facebook has it. Instagram has it. LinkedIn has it. Um, Microsoft, Google have it. Making sure that you're using two-factor authentication and making sure that you're keeping that safe. Um, secure Wi-Fi, have you updated the, the password from your Wi-Fi or is it still the one that was on the box when you, you know, installed your modem and things? Making sure that all of those are, you know, up to date. Do you need firewalls? Do you need a VPN? Don't let your people be using, you know, um, public networks if they're using a laptop while they're out and about. At the very least, um, 
tether to your phone or use a VPN. Again, thinking all the scenarios through that we talked about at the start, just taking those moments to consider everything we need to be thinking about for the business. Now, this will be an evolving list, right? This will change depending on what's going on in your company. So you're always going to be coming back to, all right, what's my assets? What, what's my exposure? I now have five staff. What do I need to be thinking through? Just a couple of questions before we recap um, from Katie. Do you have an opinion on Keeper Security app for passwords? Um, I don't. Um, uh, just Google it would be would be the answer for there. Look, every every client I've worked with has kind of ended up with LastPass, um, unless they're Apple users, in which case they tend to go for Apple Keychain. Um, the big difference between the two, because I can see you asked about Apple Keychain as well. The big difference between the two is um, Apple Keychain is great if everybody in the business is using Apple, but um, you can't generate temporary passwords. You know, I can't give you a different login for my website through Apple Keychain, et cetera. I can do that through LastPass. So just, again, thinking through what are the specifics for your business and how does that work for you? Do you have a bunch of people that are going to need to be accessing different things? Then look at something like Keeper Security, LastPass, that kind of thing. Um not disposed of any old devices as I don't know what I need to do to make sure the data is properly wiped. Okay. Um, so Katie, the, that's going to differ depending on the device. So the device was, the question was, I've not disposed any old devices as I don't know what I need to do to make sure the data is properly wiped. Can you elaborate on the wipe device a bit more, please? So, um, if you are running an Apple iPhone, for example, if you Google um, hard, re uh, not hard reset, wiping an Apple iPhone and then look for that, there will be a support.apple um, link or making a time with the Genius Bar and get them to wipe it. If it's a, a PC or a Android phone or something like that, again, my starting point would be to Google how do I wipe, how do I permanently wipe a device and have a read of a few different things. Um, if in doubt, reach out to an IT person that specializes in the PC or the Android or, you know, whatever it is. Because sadly, it's not a, um, you know, do you really want to press this button? Do you really want to press this? But, you know, it's not that simple. It's you're going to have to go in depending on whether it's a phone, a watch, a tablet, a desktop, a laptop, etc. So just making sure that you're Googling that for and, and checking that out per device. All right, so a couple of minutes to go. So just to quickly recap, the big thing, know your risks. You know, we went through the stats, we went through the phishing, the malware, the ransomware, just be aware of it. Um, awareness is the great first step because once we're aware of it, our hackles are up, we're already starting to think, oh, could this be? Understand your vulnerabilities. You know, if you've got a website, that's a vulnerability. If you're on social media, that's a vulnerability. Analyze where your business is at, map out the things that you want to consider. If you've got a team, get them to assist in developing the cybersecurity plan. So get them to be thinking about it as well and keep uh, cybersecurity education high on your business list. This stuff changes quicker than just about anything in any tech field I see. So it's really beholden to you to keep cybersecurity at the forefront of your business. So a couple of really helpful resources to start. Um cyber.gov.au forward slash ACSC small medium business. I'll put these links when I send out the recording. Um, so expect a couple of links in the email. Uh, and that one is the federal government cybersecurity and this section on small to medium business. Now there's a great about a 20 minute test you can go through and see what your exposure is like. There's also some awesome uh, resources and things on there as well. So great place to start. Now, this other one I love, Have I Been Puned? It's an Aussie guy and you can pop your email in and it will tell you if that email has been compromised on other companies' security breaches. So I put an email in there the other week and I saw that it had been compromised on a Canva breach um, and on a few others. So it's just a heads up that I can then go into that um, email address or that um, website, so Canva, for example, and make sure that I've changed my passwords, et cetera. So have I been puned.com? Great little resource to keep on top of. All right. 
30 seconds to go. We're running perfectly to time. A couple of other things to let you know. Um, if you haven't already purchased a copy of the book, The End of Technophobia, A Practical Guide to Digitizing Your Business, if you scan the QR code on screen, it will take you um, to the Buy the Book page. Um, I have a whole section on cybersecurity in there. So I did a lot of research and a lot of time spent on, you know, developing your policy and understanding cybersecurity for your business. So check that out if that's something of interest. Um, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., I'm doing my top 10 productivity tips. It's a freebie. You can sign up. I'll pop the link in the email. Um, Aspas Consults, if you're looking to dive into your cybersecurity policy for your business and get a good understanding of, you know, your exposures, we can chat that through. Um, again, if you scan the QR code, it will take you directly to a link where you can book a one-to-one -one consult with me. You pick a day and a time that suits you um, and, you know, go through that. Last QR code, I'm a bit of a fan of QR codes lately. Um, next week's podcast, Thursday the 29th, 1 p.m. Again, I record it if you can't make it live, if it's something you're interested in, what you really need to know before you launch a podcast. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know, I've got 10 years in podcasting. I've got a radio background as well. I'm one of the longstanding judges of the Australian Podcast Awards. Um, so you really talk about and dive into what that is all about in terms of podcasting. There are my contact details, my website, thedigitalguide.com.au. You can email me, info Um, You'll find me at Tracy Sheen on LinkedIn and on Facebook, Tracy the Digital Guide. Do drop me a note. Let me know what you've thought of tonight's webinar. Has it been helpful? Is there any other topics that you want me to cover in webinars? We've got a few months left of ASBAS now. So I want to try and do a couple of webinars each month and make sure that you, you know, you're building up this knowledge bank and using that muscle while we have time. So um, that's it for now. If you've got any questions, pop them into the chat box. But otherwise, um, I will stop sharing the screen. So I was going to say so I could see your lovely faces, but I can't. Um, and thank you so much for joining me on a Wednesday evening. Uh, we finished in time for you all to go and watch Lego Masters. So that probably tells you a little bit more about me than you need to know. Thanks so much, folks. Hope to see you on the productivity uh, webinar tomorrow morning at 11. Um, the recording will come out in the next couple of days. But for those of you watching the recording, that statement was redundant. So hope you enjoyed the webinar and I'll catch you on another Aspas call. Take care.